Hello and welcome to the fourth and final seminar in the Stanford Precision Health for Ethnic and Racial Equity, Transdisciplinary Collaborative Centers, Precision Health Equity and Primary Care seminar series. We are excited to conclude our series with today's seminar on the topic of polygenic risk scores in primary care screening. Next slide, please. My, my name is Sean David. I am a family physician and program director for translational science with the Outcomes Research Network and vice chair for research in the Department of Family Medicine at North Shore University Health System. And I am the clinical professor of family medicine at the University of Chicago. My co-host, Dr. Lisa Goldman Rosas, who is unable to join us today, is an assistant professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health and Department of Medicine in the Division of Primary Care and Population Health at Stanford. She's also faculty director for the School of Medicine Office of Community Development and the Stanford Cancer Institute Community Outreach and Engagement Program. The goals for this seminar today on polygenic risk scores are to first describe how risk for common complex diseases seen in primary care involve multiple genes, social determinants, and how polygenic risk scores can contribute to the risk stratification of your patients in the future and to be able to apply knowledge with the use of polygenic risk scores to patients from multiple ethnic racial backgrounds and become familiar with emerging platforms to enable its application in primary care. Next slide. So this series is accredited for one hour of AMA CME credit and is geared towards primary care providers serving diverse communities, as well as community and academic partners interested in the promotion of health equity. It is sponsored by the Stanford Office of Faculty Development and Diversity and the Health Equity Action Leadership HEAL Network and SPHERE. Next slide. So the agenda for today uh, will be our first lecture from Dr. John Witte, who is at the University of Chicago, San Francisco, and shortly will be joining us at Stanford University. And this will be followed by a brief Q&A for about five minutes. And then uh, Hannah Wand, who is a genetic counselor at Stanford will present following that lecture and that we'll have another brief Q&A. Following that, we'll have an expert panel starting at 1245 with Dr. Witte, uh, with Ms. Wand and with Dr. Jennifer Kim, who is a primary care physician and survivorship expert at Stanford. And after that, we'll have some closing remarks to conclude the seminar and the seminar series. Also, just make a uh, please note that uh, during the seminar uh, to mute your, your audio uh, and enter questions into the Q&A throughout. Um, if you have any comment or questions, please use the Q&A function for this. We will follow those and introduce those to the speakers at the end of each lecture and the expert panel. Okay. Next slide. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. John Witte, who is a professor in the Department of Epidemiology and Biostatistics and Urology at the University of California, San Francisco. And as of, I think, July 1st, Dr. Uh, Professor Witte will be at Stanford uh, in the Department of Epidemiology and Population Health. Dr. Uh, Professor Witte's research is focused on deciphering the genetic and environmental basis of prostate cancer and developing widely used methods for genetic epidemiology studies. His prostate cancer work has used comprehensive genome-wide studies of germline genetics, transcript transcriptomics, and somatic genomics to, to successfully detect novel variants underlying the risk and aggressiveness of this common disease. The key aspect of his work has been distinguishing genetic factors that may drive increased prostate cancer risk and mortality among African-American men, providing an avenue to determine which men are more likely to be diagnosed with clinically relevant prostate cancer and require additional screening or specific treatments that can help reduce uh, disparities in disease prevalence and outcomes across populations. Professor Witte has also developed advances to significantly improve our ability to detect disease uh, causing genes and to translate genetic etymologic findings into practice. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome and thank uh, Professor John Witte. Thank you, 
Thank you, Sean, for the nice introduction and the invitation to speak. Um, and welcome, everyone. Do remember, please uh, write your comments or save them for the discussion afterwards. So we were hoping that this will be a, a good discussion. So I'm going to go ahead and, and share my screen now um, with my slides. Okay, does that look okay for people who I can see? <laughs> um, okay, so <clears throat> many of you uh, may have heard about this idea of polygenic risk scores. It's become increasingly um, popular in, in the field of, of human genetics and genetic epidemiology. Um, so a polygenic risk score basically is a way to combine genetic information into a single score. And um, what has been um, quite successful in detecting genetic variants associated with different diseases, prostate cancer or, or other diseases and traits like height, um, have been genome-wide association studies. And these studies usually look at, at large populations of individuals to see whether which genetic variants are associated with a particular uh, disease or trait. However, most of the variants that are detected from a genome-wide association study uh, have what we call very small effect sizes. So the relative risks are on the order of say 1.1. So it's a fairly small increase in risk if you carry a single genetic variant. This is in contrast to uh, what you may have heard about in previous lectures about rare, more rare high penetrance mutations that really cause a large increase in risk. So um, people were uh, a little disappointed in this from genome-wide association studies because the feeling was that, that they aren't that clinically actionable or, or informative alone. So um, people started to combine them together into a single score and a what's called a polygenic risk score. So instead of looking at a single genetic variant that has a small effect size, if you create a score that is the sum of a large number of variants, anywhere from say 20 to hundreds to thousands or hundreds of thousands of variants all into a single score, this becomes um, a variant, a, an exposure, this polygenic risk score that has a much larger association with, with risk. And um, so for example, you can move for, um, from say a relative risk of 1.1 up to a relative risk of say three, four, uh, or even larger fold increase in risk comparing people in the tail of a polygenic risk score distribution to the average individual in the population. So the scores are actually a fairly simple idea. Um, really all you do is uh, in some manner or another combine genotypes with a weight for those genotypes. And the weight is most commonly the effect size, for example, the log of the relative risk. So for let's say for me, if we wanted to calculate my polygenic risk score, we would just look at all the genetic variants that are relevant to a particular disease or trait, what their effects are on those trait, multiply those two together and, and sum them all up, and I would then have a, a single score. So the two key aspects of creating a polygenic risk score are what weight to give a particular variant and which variants to include in a polygenic risk score. So these have become um, increasingly popular uh, kind of uh, almost exponential growth in the number of publications reporting on polygenic risk scores um, starting primarily about 2010, 2011. And um, as I just mentioned, this is largely because you can come up with a score that has a much larger effect. And um, some people would argue that out in the tails of a polygenic risk score, you actually have something that's like, uh, akin to a high penetrant mutation. So for example, let's say in breast cancer, we know that there's the BRCA mutations. Well, if you're in the highest few percentile of a polygenic risk score, you have a, an increased risk that's similar to carrying a high penetrance variance. So what we're here to talk about today is what their value are uh, in primary care. And um, this depends a lot on the clinical context and the genetic architecture of the disease. And what I mean by that um, is, you know, what else is already known about the disease? Do we already have really good predictors of who's at highest risk of the disease? If that's the case, then um, polygenic risk scores probably won't add that much to our existing knowledge. Um, but on the flip side, if you are looking at a disease such as prostate cancer, where there are very few known risk factors, uh, polygenic risk 
scores may actually be quite informative. And um, the other thing we'll be talking about today is really kind of what is their transferability across different populations. Many of the genome-wide association studies have been undertaken to discover the genetic variants that are part of the polygenic risk scores have been in European ancestry individuals. And so I mentioned that the two key parts of the polygenic risk score are the weights, the W and the S, what goes into them. And those um, can differ depending on what population that you are interested in applying the scores to or developing them. Um, so first I wanna start off just with an example of the potential clinical value of polygenic risk scores. And this is a, a study undertaken by a postdoc in my group, Linda Kachuri, um, looking at what the value is of polygenic risk scores beyond known cancer risk factors. And um, what we did was we looked in this large publicly available uh, cohort called the UK Biobank and looked at the time to incidence cancer or death um, and, and basically looked at known modifiable risk factors for cancer, such as smoking, body mass index, um, age, and, um, and then looked at what we would add beyond those factors by adding in this genetic information and a polygenic risk score with respect to um, predicting uh, time to, to incident cancer. Okay, and so here's um, some results showing the change in effectively the area under the curve when you added in a polygenic risk score to known genetic risk factors. So on the x-axis here, we've got a, a different cancers that we studied. And um, the y-axis is, it's giving the C-index, which is, is Harrell C. It's, a, it's effectively analogous to an AUC, but for a, a Cox time to event model. And these are ordered by the delta in C. So the change in this um, AUC-like measure when adding in the polygenic risk score. So he, down here, we've got lung. Um, if you look at smoking and lung cancer um, and age and some other known risk factors, you're going to have a fair, fairly high AUC and adding in the genetic information really doesn't change that much at all. On the other um, end, let's look down here. So here's prostate cancer. We can see that, that the known risk factors for prostate cancer, family history, um, age, gives you an AUC of uh, 0.7 something, and then you get a bump up to uh, about a 0.05 bump in AUC by adding in um, known genetic factors in the polygenic risk score. And so you can see there's a range in how much you can increase your AUC anywhere from 0.14, you know, from, or basically almost nothing up to 0.14. Um, focusing in a little bit more specifically on, um, so the AUC, going back to this, it gives you a sense of the entire distribution of the polygenic risk scores. So um, how much information that gives you in separating out cases from controls. Now, what we may be even more interested in though is looking at the tails of the polygenic risk score. So this plot just shows kind of a, a uh, distribution of what the polygenic risk scores may look like with risks. Um, so th this people up in this tail of the polygenic risk scores would be at higher risk. People at this tail would be lower and then you have average risk. And so what we looked at for prostate cancer was what are the age specific absolute risks for um, polygenic risk score for adding polygenic risk scores onto family history for prostate cancer in these three different categories. So high risk polygenic risk scores, middle and low risk. And what you can see is, um, so the, the um, three different colored lines, blue, purple, and red kind of show you the, the low. So this is the blue is low polygenic risk score. The purple is medium and the red is high. So if you focus on the red, we can see how the absolute risk bumps up it from somewhere just below 5% at age 60 for um, high polygenic risk score and no family history um, up to point something when you add in family history onto this polygenic risk score. More importantly though, the high polygenic risk score, whether it's with or without family history actually gives you a big bump in risk over the low polygenic risk score or even the average polygenic risk score. But really, if you contrast the tails of the distribution of polygenic risk score, you can see that you've got this substantial increase in risk for men um, 
uh, risk of prostate cancer for men who are in the high tail of polygenic risk score, suggesting that that these are the men that we may want to um, do more PSA testing on or, or uh, screen more often. Um, and I've mentioned that a key aspect is which variants um, should be included in polygenic risk score. And um, what is often done is people just pick what's been uh, found to be genome-wide association study, uh, genome-wide association significant. You can also though look genome-wide. Um, some of these polygenic risk scores will include hundreds of thousands of variants. Um, and it's really just kind of a, a variant selection problem of what should be included in that um, risk score. The other question is what weights should you be used? And obviously you, you should um, apply and develop. So there's kind of your discovery set and then uh, you know your training set and then your testing set. So you have to find the variants that you're going to include and their weights in one data set and then apply it to another data set. Otherwise it will um, overfit the model. And as I mentioned earlier, these are the weights are often the log relative risks. Um, but this does bring the question up about you know, which population. Um, if most of the genetic variants have been studied, in, have been detected in studies of European ancestry populations, will these polygenic risk scores work if you just apply them directly to other ancestral populations? Or will you actually increase potential health disparities by using a polygenic risk score that's not really applicable to an, another population? So I want to um, mention some other work from my lab. This is a, a PhD student, Taylor Cavazos, um, who looked at, um, with a simulation study, kind of how transferable these polygenic risk scores are, are across populations. And um, what we showed was, first of all, that, um, that the accuracy, kind of uh, how accurate a polygenic risk score is for, is for predicting risk of disease decreases with uh, less European ancestry population. So if it's discovered in a European ancestry population, it won't work nearly as good. Um, and this is basically a linear um, relationship whereby the accuracy gets lower and lower, the less proportion of European ancestry a, a, an admixed individual has. Um, and then we looked more specifically, so we, were, we um, the simulation, we kind of simulated African versus European um, populations and kind of looked at um, the, the different um, populations and whether the weights from particular populations, so the W that was used, the, the S and the W, which would work the best. And it turns out that if basically, um, if we had started with African populations to begin with, so instead of studying Europeans and then developing a polygenic risk score from them, if we'd started with African ancestry individuals, we would actually have a more accurate polygenic risk score and a more transferable polygenic risk score to European populations. Um, and this was interesting. It makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, the African population is an older population. And um, I think that you basically are I don't know if the, the right term is kind of covering your bases, but you're, you're getting a deeper, more informative um, polygenic risk score by studying that population first. Um, and then it turns out that actually you can mixture, you can use a mixture of uh, polygenic risk scores by combining individuals um, or information from genome-wide association studies that include both European ancestry and African ancestry. Um, and if you want, there's a lot of specific details um, but you can go ahead and look at this paper if you want more details. But the, the bottom line is that, that just using European ancestry polygenic risk scores and applying them to other populations um, does have uh, a, a real potential for uh, increasing health disparities due to um, not being accurate in predicting risk. Uh, so the last thing I wanna mention is actually um, a trans-ethnic polygenic risk score that we developed and applied to, to prostate cancer. This is a huge, collaborative project, over 100,000 cases and 100,000 controls. And um, the, I mean, we've been working on this for a long time and there's, uh, this was the most recent publication to come out of this collaborative group. And um, what we did was we searched for prostate cancer risk variants using a multi-ethnic meta-analysis of the genome-wide association studies. So in with this huge population sample size, we actually had a, a reasonable number of 
non-European ancestry individuals. So we were able to look within different ancestral populations, undertake GWAS within them, and then combine them all together and developed a kind of trans-ethnic polygenic risk score. So there's variants in this polygenic risk score that say are were only found in Asian populations, but they're in that polygenic risk score. So we've developed something that kind of hopefully would work across different ethnic groups. And we did find that it actually had um, similar uh, prediction. So this is kind of like the figure I showed before where we have the risk of, of prostate cancer by age. And we've uh, broken it down to European ancestry versus African American. And the top line is showing the people in the highest percentile of the polygenic risk score, what their risk is. Um, so you can see that the absolute risk is, is quite high and it really separates out when you look at the top decile or the top percentile of polygenic risk scores. Interestingly enough, it actually worked relatively well in the African American population. Um, and in fact, this surprised me a little bit. Um, and just that, that even though it was a trans-ethnic meta, I mean, I think that helped a lot because we were, we were finding pan-ethnic variants. Um, and we were also leveraging uh, information about populations to, to refine the lead genetic variants in a region. Um, and this may also reflect the fact that prostate cancer is one of the most heritable of common cancers. So there's a very strong genetic component to the disease. And it looks like a lot of the genetic variants are actually um, are similar across the different ancestral populations, which makes it a fair amount of sense. Um, and so actually the one last thing I wanna mention is that we just actually received an award uh, from the NIH and it's a big project, the value of polygenic risk scores in diverse populations. So we're, um, the, but this is actually, this project is across all different um, phenotypes and the idea is to kind of take a diversity first construction of polygenic risk scores, somewhat like what we did in prostate cancer. So instead of just saying, well, this is what we have from European ancestries, it's really to try to develop new methods and apply polygenic risk scores that, that really leverage um, diverse populations um, at the outset. And so that, that we're, we're kind of starting from that, that background. So this should be a, an exciting project. Um, and, uh, and it, with really important uh, ramifications, what we find. So with that, um, I do have this last thing I think, I think Hannah will talk about. This. So at Stanford, there's actually an effort to um, look at polygenic risk scores in a clinical setting for uh, uh, coronary artery disease, breast cancer, and prostate cancer. So we're just kicking this off. And, and this is part of what that I'll be involved with at Stanford is translating polygenic risk scores into a pilot study in, at Stanford Health. Um, so I will go ahead and stop and, and open it up to any questions. Thank you, Professor Witte, for a really amazing uh, presentation. And the trans-ethnic work is, is quite exciting. While we're waiting for questions from the attendees, I had a question for you about inclusion of BRCA uh, mutations in polygenic risk scores and whether that can be done or how it affects how it, there's an effect modification by the polygenic risk score of the BRCA risk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. Um, so everything that goes into the polygenic risk scores I was talking about are common low risk variants. And um, so what Sean's talking about is what about the high risk variants? And there's a lot of interest in this right now. Um, you generally wouldn't want to fold that necessarily into the risk score itself. It's almost better, like you said, like an effect modifier either the risk scores modifying the effect of the, the high risk, high penetrance mutation or vice versa. Um, but what we're seeing is that, um, well, depending on what the high risk mutation is um, and depending on the disease, that it can be either kind of a, a synergistic increase in risk or it can be that, that they almost are um, orthogonal to each other, that people with the high mutation have a high risk no matter what their polygenic risk score is. And in fact, it's not, you know, it's almost like um, it, it may be that if you have a high risk mutation, the polygenic risk score doesn't really add any more, much more information to it, but it's a real, it's an active area of research and um, it makes sense. I mean, 
really what we want is a model that incorporates everything we know about the disease, whether it's age, family history, um, polygenic risk scores, high risk mutations, and then use that to determine an individual's risk when we're talking about um, you know, clinical practice. Yeah. yeah, that truly precision medicine, Yeah, we can get there. Well, thank you so much. Well, I think we'll get more questions as we, as the seminar goes on. So perhaps we could thank you again and segue to our second speaker. Very good. And so Hannah Wand is a preventive genetics program director for Stanford Healthcare and is a genetics counselor at Stanford University. She is working on the translation of polygenic risk scores and personalized risk assessments into clinical practice. She leads a preventive genomics effort translating polygenic risk scores at Stanford, in addition to serving on several NIH consortium and society committees to develop uh, cl uh, clinical standards for polygenic risk scores. As a genetic counselor, she's interested in the person-centered approaches to developing new clinical services, and her research focuses on equitable and culturally competent genetic service delivery. So, uh, Hannah, welcome, and uh, Thank the floor you. is yours. Thanks. I am having internet issues, so I'm Hoping this works. <laughs> okay. Uh, can you see my slides, everyone? Yes. Great. Okay. Um, so thank you, Sean, for that introduction. As you've said, I'm I'm Hannah. Um, and as you've also kind of discussed, so a lot of my work is in the area of precision public health. Um, that's where that focus on service delivery to populations comes in. Uh, you know, within precision public health or public health genomics, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's this need to kind of reconcile having more systematic and equitable service delivery with the fact that genetics is sensitive um, and you need person-centered practice. So I often try to like walk that line um, in my practice. Um, so today I'm just hoping to emphasize that, you know, polygenic risk scores, they're really just another application of precision public health. And there's a lot that we can anticipate in terms of translational barriers and challenges just from what we already know from population screening programs. So before we begin, just wanna make sure we're all on the same page in terms of what PRS looks like in primary care. There are a lot of use cases that, uh, for PRS, so just good to be specific here. <clears throat> so to start off with, I think a lot of what I'm gonna say here is recapping um, what John's told us about coming up with a PRS, um, but just very quickly, First step you want to do is just to identify places for common genetic changes that have been associated with disease. Um, so throughout, I'm going to use the example of heart disease because that's my clinical background. Um, so say, for example, maybe there's a thousand potential locations where you have this common genetic change for heart disease. Um, after you know what are the possible changes for an individual person, you're going to want to know like what, what do they actually carry. So again, referring to heart disease, if there's a thousand possible spots in the genome where you can have a common genetic change, um, maybe I, for example, have 800 of those versus you know, my sister having 400, my friend having 50, et cetera. Um, so every, person's at, every person at the end of the day has their own specific PRS number for whatever disease of interest. Um, but I've, as I've already kind of alluded to, and as John alluded to, um, really this information is most useful or meaningful um, in terms of the population distribution. I was trying to think of an analogy for this. I think probably the closest that I can think of in my practice is cholesterol. Um, so everyone has their unique cholesterol number, right? You go for your lipid test, you get a number back. Um, but at the end of the day, it's only meaningful to you to know like where you are within the average range. If you're outside of that average range, um, my LDL might be 90. If I'm approaching like 100, maybe that's not so good. Um, so really this kind of sense of relative uh, number or risk is going to be similar to how PRS are interpreted. And the way that this is going to be used in primary care for the most part, again, defining the specific use case, there are other ones, but for primary care, um, it's really going to be around the concept of preventive screening. Um, so already in primary care, uh, and I'll, I'll defer to Jennifer later, <laughs> later on. Uh, but really, we, we're already screening for co common chronic conditions, right? So we have different screening markers like biometrics, including cholesterol, um, that we already use to try to think about someone's risk for common chronic conditions. Really, the idea here in primary care, again, is to add PRS as an additional screening marker for these common diseases. <clears throat> 
And really the reason we're doing this is because we've known for a while now that there is a genetic contribution to these common chronic conditions in addition to environment and lifestyle. So really the idea behind PRS, as John said, it's not novel, it's quite simple. Um, we've known genetics have played a role in common chronic conditions for a while now. Um, it's just that the novelty here is that PRS is a new technology that helps to quantify this. Um, so for anyone that already counsels around multifactorial disease, PRS should feel familiar conceptually. And on that note, <laughs> it's also really important then to not oversell what a PRS is telling you. As many of us already know, already know um, these chronic conditions, uh, genetics alone is not going to be the main driver for disease. Uh, instead, for both providers and patients, really the most informative piece of information is going to be that integrated risk. And what I mean by integrated risk is combining the, the polygenic uh, risk information that you get with conventional markers that we've already associated with disease risk. Because that, that's really what gives you that complex disease kind of holistic um, understanding of what's going on in a patient. And I mentioned that obviously because for providers on the call today, in terms of medical management um, and any counseling you do with your patient, it should really be based in that holistic picture and like not only in the polygenic risk score. So just giving uh, more of an illustrative example of what that looks like, again, using heart disease as my example, we already use like the pooled cohort equation or a CBD calculator to predict heart disease risk. Um, it's really just a matter of adding on your genetic risk in the form of the polygenic risk score to help guide your practice. And I guess that kind of prompts the question then, like, what do you mean by guiding practice? There are different ways to think about the utility of this information. Um, I think probably the most well known to this audience is that of clinical utility and actionability. These go pretty hand in hand. So does PRS truly predict disease? In what way does it improve outcomes? Usually involves intervening at some threshold. Um, but one that I'm interested in, probably not surprising with my genetic counseling background is that of personal utility. Um, so this is focused more on how does health information, including PRS, um, how does that help someone like adapt and cope to disease or possible disease? Uh, reactions, they can be cognitive. Um, so thinking about better understanding of disease and the role of health behaviors. Um, it can also be emotional. Um, it can deal with things like stigma and things like that as well. And finally, public health utility. Again, just thinking that PRS, because it's focused on common conditions that we already screen for from a public health lens and a population screening lens, really important to take into account what is the public, util uh, public health utility here. And I think John also discussed about this, you know, are there other options available? What's the cost utility here? What's the added benefit at the population scale? Um, do people have access to this? Is it improving population health? Is it decreasing or exacerbating disparities? Um, so you also need that kind of population level approach. And I would say all of these are critical. There's no one thing that's kind of going to be the driver in terms of whether or not we move this into practice. So I think I've mostly focused on like kind of highlighting the benefits or the reasons why we're trying to even translate this in the first place. Um, but I kind of mentioned there, there are things we've learned just in population screening in general that I, I can anticipate um, being challenges for this. Um, so I wanted to balance that conversation, thinking about real world challenges more at the programmatic and systematic level. Um, these are not specific to PRS, but just genomic services in general, uh, but definitely ones that will be exacerbated with PRS because it's really the first application in genomic medicine that's primed for you know, the general population rather than you know, rare disease type of patients. So first thing we're gonna run into is infrastructure. Uh, as shown in this little pyramid here, you really need the infrastructure in place before you can support any population-based services like polygenic risk scores. Uh, we need to invest in our electronic medical record, provider training, billing policies, you know, patient education around genomics. All of that really needs to be in place so that we're not having this like one-on-one -on -one kind of manual process in terms of implementing this at scale. Um, and I can tell you that a lot of this is not currently in place because a lot of historical genomic information, it's been uh, kind of siloed in terms of rare disease. So uh, again, Jennifer, I'll defer to you for your experience, but I don't think genomic training is you know, routine or kept up with in terms of provider training. Uh, certainly in my experience interacting with patients, it's not, not the common thing that you can assume. Um, same with you know, billing and things like that. 
so if we want to have this practice, we need the infrastructure to be at kind of a higher level for us to really plug into because there's not something to plug into right now. Um, second kind of learning lesson, I guess, it's not just a matter of scaling, um, scaling resources or anything like that. We also need to change. Um, currently with genetic services and access to them, it's not very systematic. Um, it's very much driven by biases or privileges of the patient. Um, so we really need to change that because what we see currently is that there's disparities by race, um, SES status in terms of like insurance coverage and things like that, whether or not you speak English and you have like materials available for you, uh, things like geographic area, do you have like a certain provider that's trained in a certain way available to you? Uh, so all of these current disparities are gonna, you know, exponentially increase if we scale what we currently have. We can't just, you know, do, do what we have already and make it bigger. We have to change what we have and then make it bigger. Um, so that's gonna be another major barrier. Uh, we can talk about this in discussion. I don't have a clear answer on how we fix this. Just know that it's a it's an issue. And then third and final point that I want to make in terms of like a major kind of general problem with genetics that are going to be exacerbated with PRS. Uh, we really need to engage the public. Again, it's a population level service. We've kind of escaped needing to involve the public before because it's been a lot of rare disease focus in genomics. Um, but as a population level service, we need to kind of, you know, start involving people more broadly. And this is because genetic identity, it's really complex. You know, we don't want to over medicalize what's common. What we need are experts in political science, anthropology, and so on, um, to really just inform us on how to think about genetic identity through a more complex social lens, um, particularly with marginalized um, populations. Because uh, we don't, yeah, we don't want to reinforce any forms of discrimination or like power conflicts or anything like that through, through the like kind of widespread uh, implementation of genomic medicine as a routine thing in healthcare. Uh, at the center of this kind of ethical legal agenda or LC agenda, uh, we should really have public engagement. Um, from the few studies that have tried to do this already, we already know that. Although there's like a fairly universal curiosity in one's genetics, there's a lot of concerns in terms of data privacy and protection and things like that. So I think it's really important that we have more of these studies that take into account um, how the public at general, like uh, at a general scale, thinks about the pros and cons of this and not only have that clinical perspective in terms of pros and cons. Uh, so I'll wrap up, I guess, with uh, a more positive note, hopefully, in terms of a way forward. Um, I'm not an expert in learning health systems, but I do really like this idea. Uh, it's a little bit more of a pragmatic approach to, to try things before they're clinic ready in the more like traditional paternalistic sense. It's very similar to QI. You kind of remove that barrier between uh, research or silo, I guess, silo between research and clinic um, where, you know, you can test things in real time, evaluate this clinical and other utility measures I talked about. Um, adapt and respond to those real world challenges that I also talked about. Um, and at the end of the day, hopefully you have more like real time adaptivity to the clinical environment. Um, another benefit I see with this actually is that we reach more like real world clinical populations. Uh, you know, uh, to John's point about a lot of the development of PRS being optimized for white populations, none of that is done because no one wants a, you know, like a white PRS score. It's because that's what they have access to. Um, so at the end of the day, I just think we need these more, I don't know, creative approaches to fixing the more systemic uh, challenges that we have with precision medicine and, and trying to integrate research uh, more intentionally, I guess, in the clinical environment is potentially a way to address that and also to account for things like policy and insurance and things like that that aren't necessarily um, within the scope of research or at least within the scope of what researchers feel they should be studying. Um, so. I think more of these hybrid approaches of like research translating into clinic are probably necessary for PRS and uh, precision medicine more broadly. We've certainly seen uh, the use case with COVID recently. Uh, so on that note, uh, I know I definitely have more questions than answers, so I try to keep it pretty brief. I'll just say it's a very complex issue, a uh, very interdisciplinary effort ahead. Uh, I, I want to stop here and leave more time for questions because I imagine a lot of you have them, um, but looking forward to discussion. And hopefully now I can share my video without it crashing. <laughs>
Great. Thank you, Hannah. That's really a fantastic overview of the, of the issue. And I wanted to um, ask you a question about, so Sphere has done a lot of community engagement, uh, mixed methods research with minority communities around communication of genetic information. One of the areas we didn't really get into was polygenic risk score communication and, and whether there might be certain if the same issues are, arise culturally in terms of taboos discussing this or um, concerns about genetic discrimination for things like diabetes or, or common cancers that might be very different than what we usually think about. So yeah. I wonder what your thoughts are about, first of all, communication archetypes and how to approach this as a primary care physician with something that is kind of still translating from research into practice. Mm -hmm. and secondly, about how PCPs and FQHCs and, and minority communities, how they can be local champions and engage as they try to implement in sensitive ways. Yeah, this is why I think there's there's a need to really push or, or to push the, the public engagement and public voice in terms of just like the research setting, because a lot of what policy and practice is built on is the research, right? But I can speak as a provider, I feel pretty informed on the nuance there as a provider with the one-on-one -on -one interactions I have with people. Um, but if I'm not getting out there and disseminating that information, it's not going to be known. Um, so actually, like one model we've had for that at Stanford, so John mentioned that we have this program coming up, um, the, the patient's at the, you know, the center of that. Um, so actually through Lisa's help, and I'm sorry she couldn't be here today, um, we were able to convene um, a community group through the Patient and Family Partners Program at Stanford and go over exactly those questions of, you know, what are your reactions to this? What experiences are you drawing on? And we can get kind of a range of experience on and advice on where, you know, what factors might be driving differences there, whether it's like uh, cultural differences or, you know, disease experience differences or, or what have you. Um, and, and I think we need more of an evidence base to really comment on that because that's not widely available yet. Um, but yeah, in terms of like that learning healthcare system approach, it, it's why I like that idea a little bit better because it's like clinical practice with a little bit more intention where we're also backing the funding to, to evaluate what we're doing in real time um, and mm -hmm. get that feedback as we go. Uh, so yeah, I, I'm hoping we learn as we go. I'll say, frankly, right now, I don't think we have a good guess. A lot of it is very like hypothetical questions with people about like the idea of precision medicine, um, not in a way where they've implemented people actually receiving those results. That makes sense, thank you. So um, yeah, and, and I think, you know, how do, how do primary care physicians when they're getting to know a patient taking a family history, social history, how do they be open up discussions about this issue, which is sensitive like end of life decision-making other things. Um, those are competencies that haven't been really well defined in the training. And it seems like another education is another area that needs to be developed. So thank you very much. Um, would like to actually introduce our, our next guest today. We could go back to the slides. So thank you. Dr. Jennifer Kim is a primary care physician, a general internist at Stanford Healthcare. Uh, she's also an expert in uh, survivorship research for cancer. In 2018, Dr. Kim established the primary, Stanford Primary Care Cancer Survivorship Clinic, where she focuses on how cancer and cancer treatment impact health, both physically and emotionally in survivors, and now and moving forward. And before we move to our panel, we have a question for Dr. Kim. As a primary care physician, how would you approach discussions about genetic risk for conditions such as heart disease, cancer, or diabetes in addition to the social determinants of health, particularly with patients from minority communities. Hi, everyone. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, this has been really interesting for me to learn about this. And, um, uh, you know, I certainly have um, a lot of patients with heart disease and diabetes, but um, tend to see a lot of uh, cancer survivors through, through my program. So um, have a lot of questions about all of these areas. Uh, and, you know, I think that to me, my initial sort of reaction as a primary care doctor is how does this information get to me, 
right? Like how can I even interpret it to be able to pass some of that on to my patients? And um, you know, having very specific information and background, it, I think is very important to this because a lot of these, uh, the, the burden of some of this ends up on PCPs uh, and having to sort of explain um, and any of the fallout that comes from that in some, of, in some ways I think really helpful and in some ways I think potentially not. Um, and so, you know, I think it's different for me if something comes in a, you know, you have a 17% increased risk of prostate cancer versus you are in an intermediate risk group. And what do I do with that? And how do I talk to patients about it? And what resources do I have? Not in, not only in terms of, you know, here, look at this website, but of time, of education that I'm getting about it. And um, the more referrals I give to people, often the more drop off there is of you know, people who are going to see all those providers. Um, and I think, I think you start with first trying to explore with patients, do they want to know more about their genetic risks? Um, and, you know, what are the options? And, you know, do these options have preventative measures? For instance, like cardiac disease has a lot more preventative measures than if I'm getting to tell somebody their breast cancer, you know, risk score. Um, and, as with anything, I think sure decision making is really important in an area like genetic risk scores. Um, but all providers are a little bit different in, in how we do this, even for prostate cancer screening, which is I think one of our most common you know, shared decision making screening tools. Um, and how to communicate this effectively varies a lot, right? On the doctor patient relationship of confidence and trust or how much the family is involved in decision making, what the patient's health literacy is, how long the appointment time is for me to even talk about this. Um, and, and part of this is how well you know the patient, right? Do I understand a patient's health goals? And if they are somebody who really is all about prevention and they want to know this and this is going to be important, they're going to be able to have, uh, you know, not only the wherewithal to, you know, make preventative change, but um, or not limited in other ways. I think Hannah was referring to sort of this trifecta of genetics and environment and lifestyle. Um, but there, there just are patients who, while they can't control their genes, they can't really control their environment and their lifestyle very much. Um, whether that be they can't afford medication or they can't afford healthier nutrition or they can't afford a gym membership or you know what the, whatever that is. Um, and so, you know, how understanding, I think, a, a bit more of the patient's background and how I, as a primary care doctor, can tell them if they can make a difference after, you know, receiving this risk score. Um, and understanding, I think, a little bit about the patient and their experiences, whether it be good or bad, with not only the medical system, but about these diseases in particular. If it's like, oh, my aunt had breast cancer, and she had this horrible, horrible uh, you know, life until the end, and I don't want to know is very different than, you know, somebody who might have, uh, you know, a family member who is very responsible about their heart disease and actually now is, you know, a marathon runner. Um, and, you know, who patients feel comfortable communicating with. Is it MDs? Is it advanced practice providers? Is it genetic counselors? Do they have you know, a gender preference of who they even feel comfortable talking about this with? Community-based resources for counseling versus you know, more hospital-based resources? Um, and how am I communicating with them? For instance, like, do I need a translator? And if I'm using a translator, do I use a family member? Uh, and I think particularly in some cultures, uh, when you use children as translator for older uh, patients, there's like a selective filtration and I not speaking the language don't know what information is actually going back and forth there. Um, and I think ensuring some of that is, is really important. Um, so, you know, how, I'm, I know this is a very long winded answer, but um, you know, how this risk impacts their other comorbidities that they have, you know, any other support that they have, particularly for me with cancer, is thinking about, um, you know, do they have family support of a living situation, employment, what will it do to their uh, insurance, whether it be life insurance or medical insurance, and their thoughts about this or the ability to change this, um, and financial health and emotion, I think Hannah touched on this, but the emotional burden 
of knowing some of these things in that many of my cancer survivors know they not only have an increased risk for recurrence of their primary cancer, but a much increased risk for a lot of other kinds of cancers or heart disease. And um, it leads to a lot of symptom hypervigilance for some people of calling me back every time they have a headache or every time they have a cough because they're sort of waiting for the other shoe to drop. Um, you know, and what that can be do for some people who, and it can be very triggering and um, who is best to decide whether that person, you know, should get this or even be offered this. And it seems very paternalistic to say that, you know, me as a provider should be the one choosing that. Um, but I think that it has a really significant impact on a lot of people and, you know, calling you back after they've gone down many Google rabbit holes or, um, you know, talking to their family. So uh, I think all of these things are, are what I think about when I hear about polygenic risk scores um, and things that I think uh, are difficult, right? In, in me even starting with like how precise is precision medicine that we're talking about if, you know, I have somebody who's ethnically very diverse and that their risk score for diabetes might be really accurate but their risk score for prostate cancer might be really inaccurate. And how, you know, how do I know that to even start? But so. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, that's amazing. And, and uh, primary care physicians, really wonderful empathic ones like you deal with the complexity all the time. And it's complexity in the bio, the psycho and the social, and to be able to have that prescience and, and ability to address it is, a real gift. Um, it'd be amazing if every patient could have this trio of lifeline with <laughs> Dr. Witte, Doc, Dr. Kim, and, and, um, and Hannah Wand. Uh, but we need systems to translate this in, in ways that, but still there's human beings treating other human beings and it comes down to that. So thank you. That was really wonderful, all three presenters. I'd like to transition into our expert panel. <clears throat> and just reintroduce our, our speakers today, Professor John Witte from University of San Francisco, University of Chicago, San Francisco, and University of California, San Francisco, and shortly Stanford University, uh, Hannah Wan from Stanford, and Dr. Jennifer Kim. And if we could transition to the discussion questions. We have three discussion questions, and these are uh, open to all three of our speakers today. The first is, are polygenic risk scores ready for prime time to be implemented in primary care? If not, what additional discovery and implementation science do we need to get there? Perhaps we could start with uh, Professor Witte. I think the answer is it depends. Um, certainly not as a blanket statement, not all polygenic risk scores and um, and that's um, in part why Stanford Health is undertaking this pilot study to see how people react to this offer. And, and um, so they're, they're, they're at different levels of development for different diseases and traits. Um, and there's also, uh, as we've talked about a little bit today, you know, what, what's the next step? And that's obviously an important question. You, you don't want to determine this information if there's no actionable next step that can be done. So if it's just to tell someone, oh, we think you're at a higher risk of disease, but there's nothing you could do, well, that's not valuable at all. Um, so uh, yeah, it depends. Um, how's that for a, a vague answer? But um, I think that um, with regard to the additional discovery and implementation science, um, obviously there's a, a huge need for studying more diverse populations and, um, and developing methods to make sure that the polygenic risk scores um, don't increase health disparities um, by being applied in, incorrectly or inaccurately. Um, and I think um, I really appreciate Jennifer's points about, you know, what, it, it, this is a, uh, a complicated thing to communicate to a patient. I mean, it's not, it's not complicated for so, but it's, it's complex and, and how you, um, how you communicate that, how they will react to it, whether it does trigger some some feeling like, I you know I have this deterministic risk and I'm going to get disease X Y and Z because, um, it, it so it is 
very complicated. We can calculate polygenic risk scores on people at birth, right? So what are we prepared for that? <laughs> and um, you know, is this something that we're, um, you know, I, I think with regard to to we do need some uh, much more work with implementation science and understanding what's the best approach to communicate this information if um, if it is at a point where it's developed enough for being communicated to patients. Yeah. Thank you. Great. And and Hannah, also from your standpoint too, uh, do, do you think there are areas? And I know you're doing research in this area where it might be ready, particularly the transethnic polygenic risk scores and. And it's, it's really not a one size fits all message necessarily, is it? It's yeah. I agree with John. I, I don't think it's as black and white as asking as, you know, if it's ready or not. Um, I think honestly, just in medicine in general, we really need to like move away from that mindset and have such a like clear divide between like what's research and what's clinic. Cause the, the reality is that it's, it's very iterative. Right. Um, and not to, to beat the horse to death, but I, I think the COVID example is one that in my social circles I've seen as being one way people kind of get this idea um, where they're realizing like in real time we need to adapt to what we learn. Um, and obviously that's a very different situation because it's crisis mode, right? That we're willing to, to kind of reduce the bureaucracy between um, research and clinic. But I, I do wonder what the lasting change of that will be. Um, and if we can kind of shift the culture of medicine to be one where patients are more informed on this idea that, you know, practice is going to change with time. We don't have everything figured out at the point of care, um, especially for those with complex needs. Um, and yeah, I just, I tend to be someone that's not an if person, but a how person. Um, and the reality is that this has already started and it's a matter of figuring out how, how to do it correctly. Um, so I think we need to focus more on like, what are the most impactful changes to make to make this something that is an environment of safety, I guess. Um, so really focusing on the, the general kind of lay public um, edu education on this so that it's less of this like power dynamic of provider and patient talking about complex issues and more one that's more of a partnership. Because a lot of this conversation, as we've talked about, the communication is very nuanced. Um, so yeah, there's just, there's, you know, high high impact things that we can change at, again, that infrastructural level to just make this a, a more easily implemented thing in terms of like trial and error, where I think everyone would just feel more comfortable all around. We need an electronic medical record system that can tr track, um, you know, what's happening so that we can evaluate and adjust in real time. Um, so yeah, I just, I, I think we need a practice shift and PRS is like one example of something that's pushing that, but there are other ones too. Um, and as long as we have that system in place to be able to do this safely and protect the patients, because again, at the end of the day, we need to protect their interests. Um, then yeah, hopefully move to, to like a more adaptive system than what we currently have. Uh, I'll say the rate limiting step that I found is that outside of the, the immediate healthcare system policy and legal implications of, of genetic information is often the kind of like dinosaur in the medical process. It's the rate limiting step. Uh, it takes a while to come up with policy, a while to change policy. So inherently, we're kind of limited to what we can do based on policies that exist to protect people. Ben or I guess the good side of polygenic risk scores is that there are a lot of policies in place right now that should cover PRS. And that's part of why I guess we're trying to figure out if we can move forward, because that's not as much of an issue as we thought it'd be. Obviously, there's a lot of room for misunderstanding with that, but uh, that's kind of on big, bigger players to figure out and make sure that doesn't happen. Thank you. It's certainly with, with the SNPs, a lot of this is out there in the public already through direct-to-consumer <laughs> exactly. tests. And so people are learning on their own how to interpret this. And without us being involved in the process, then we're really missing an opportunity to lead. So I really agree with that learning health system approach. So this next question is, how can we apply polygenic risk scores to patients from non-European backgrounds, uh, particularly around primary care and prevention? And let's take the example of prostate cancer in African-American men. Uh, would this change our approach, both in terms of age of screening and other things? And this is another complex issue for a lot of reasons because of the lack of specificity of PSAs and other things, but I wonder if you could 
address that issue, how you, how you might approach this now based on the transethnic analyses that exist. I'll let John lead on methods. I have a <laughs> more of a clinical perspective on this, but. Uh... Well, I think as I should, prostate cancer is a little bit unique because of how the so many um, large sample sizes across different um, ancestral populations have already been studied. So we actually have a polygenic risk score that looks like it's reasonably accurate across different populations. So that, but that's not the case with a lot of other cancers. So in, in that way, um, I mean, there's more refinement that's, that, that can happen and more improvement, but it's not as though there's a huge gap between the polygenic risk, you know, that the polygenic risk score has only been developed in, in one population. But I, I do think, you know, we mentioned sensitivity and specificity with the PRS for prostate cancer. You know, if you can take people in the top decile or two, you know, the, the lower part of that distribution, people who are at much lower genetic risk of, of cancer are maybe people that don't need as much PSA screening, right? And so I think that that would be a way to, um, to really think about the application because the specificity, you know, it's the, the sensitivity is the issue, but if you can actually define people who are already at high risk, um, it may be that the, that in those cases, the PSA um, with all of its issues and um, I mean, the issue isn't so much PSA per se, it's, it's a matter of what we do when we detect low grade disease, right? And, and over treatment of prostate cancer. Um, and we're just on the cusp of seeing whether these polygenic risk scores actually are predictive of what we want to know, which is who's going to die from prostate cancer, right? Um, so I think, I think that uh, that adds another cost, which for, for prostate cancer is, is somewhat complicated because of um, the fact that it's such a slow growing latent disease in most men and, and large majority of them shouldn't actually even be treated. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll add to that and say like, uh, so to John's point, I think it's really important that we, we have equitable tests on the technical side that can perform for different ancestries. I'm excited at the stage where like, if we are there on the technical side, what the future of medicine looks like. Um, so I, I didn't get a chance to highlight this in my talk, but you know, race is a social construct. It's very distinct from genetic ancestry. Um, and especially in the US, the history of how you know, race labels were made um, was very much based on like appearance, country of origin, et cetera, et cetera, to, to reinforce different power dynamics and all of that. Um, and, and that has kind of persisted in medicine where there are a lot of race-based disparities um, with people making presumptions about like what social determinants of health you're likely to like to have had as your history, um, whether or not you, you know, we offer tests differentially based on whether or not we think you can afford it. And if we think that the genetics are the underlying cause versus like some lifestyle or what have you. Um, so I think there's a lot of subjectivity in medicine and I'm actually quite excited if we can get to a place where hopefully genetics, because it's so uh, independent of constructs, right? It's just, it's you. And if we get to a place where talking about you is in a fair way, um, does that actually help to eliminate those disparities and stigmatizations and discriminations that we see in that more subjective conversational uh, level of medicine? Um, and just speaking as someone that's like mixed race, for example, like I don't know how to answer my race whenever I have to fill it out. And I'm sure how I fill it out affects every other level of care after that. And if I actually had a score that just accounted for me as me and not having to fill some arbitrary box, would I have more like tailored medicine without having the discomfort of these like social lenses that we use um, for medicine? Um, so I think that's like a, a, a potential, hopefully, hopefully good um, future use case in terms of the ancestral background that polygenic risk scores account for. It will hopefully start to like point out the flaws that we have with these race-based practices in medicine. Thank you. And, and so this final question is, what do you see as the barriers to communicating polygenic risk for common chronic diseases? So things like type two diabetes, 
cardiovascular disease and so forth that have a lot of environmental determinants, um, particularly in diverse communities. To all three, uh, Dr. Kim as well. Because we were just talking about the example of Framingham scores just being one part of how you might counsel a patient on cardiovascular disease risk. Um, but what if you had a, some, a score that was even more predictive or it was added to it? How would, how would that change your approach to communication? Yeah, I mean, I think I talked a lot about what I thought might be barriers, but um, I yeah. do agree with Hannah that I think that um, some of this could be really promising, right? And that it takes away some of the subjective framework, you know, that you put on a patient. And I think some issues like mm -hmm. diabetes, um, there is much more prevention that you could do. And it's sort of like how we, I think sometimes about like a coronary calcium score of like as a tiebreaker type of a thing. It's not because you have this, you're absolutely going to get a heart attack. But if you have this polygenic risk score, look, you know, you have a much higher risk of getting diabetes, which can lead to a lot of these other complications, which you might have seen in your family. And, you know, a lot of us don't want. Um, and, you know, how can we refocus our talk on how to keep you healthy, right? Because we know you have higher risk instead of, oh my gosh, like this is just like your fate is sealed, right? Like you're going to get diabetes. It's going to be terrible. Um, and so I, I would like to be able to use it in a way that this is, you know, a privilege of technology that we have something that is really specific to you and your risk. And it doesn't mean that this is going to happen. But how can we utilize this to keep you healthier? Um, because there's a sort of, you know, a whole lot of other comorbidities that come with this. And I think it really does depend already on diverse communities, but common chronic diseases like diabetes is already sort of built into primary care about some of our counseling, uh, you know, talking about nutrition in a way that's uh, sensitive to your ethnic cuisine um, or, you know, things that are translated in many languages. I think that's a, another big thing about this in communication is having resources that are in many different languages. Um, so for common chronic diseases that are, you know, preventable and, you know, we already have a lot of infra infrastructure around, I think it, it might be very beneficial. Thank you very much. Well, we're at the end of our time. So I'd like to actually keep talking for another 10 minutes or so, but we're at the end of our time. And I would like to thank our three brilliant speakers today, uh, Dr. Witte, Dr. Kim, and, and Ms. Wand for a really thorough multi-stakeholder set of perspectives on polygenic risk scores and how we might approach working with some sensitivity with diverse populations. and and a learning healthcare system. This concludes the uh, Sphere Precision Health Equity and Primary Care Seminar Series. Each one of these seminars is available on the Sphere website at the following link. And there is, again, CME credit for providers to apply for. Um, this uh, also will be, there'll be a, an evaluation that you will be asked to complete first. And we'd like to really thank all of our speakers throughout the series and my, my co-host, Dr. Uh, Goldman Roses for really a wonderful um, seminar series and educational resource for the future. And thank you again, everyone for taking the time from your busy schedules to uh, present today. Great, thank you everyone. Thanks. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.